Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. This is Andy Revkin, Columbia Climate School, coming to you live from uh, Wabanaki territory in Maine. Just got back here from a flight in a very tiny little prop plane from Boston. I was speaking at a conference in uh, at Harvard on how to foster resilience on a fast changing planet in poor countries. And I'm really pleased today to host a uh, screening of the latest in a long series of films that are student made, uh, faculty facilitated films uh, through the Pace University uh, media program uh, that focus on various aspects of sustainability. Uh, I was part of this class from 2010 to 2016. I was really pleased to uh, work with Professor Maria Luske, uh, who had already developed this uh, spring course where students, uh, it's what's called uh, project-based learning where you go and place-based learning where you go out in the field and you shoot a film. There's nothing like doing it. There's not, not a classroom process as you'll learn from the students and faculty in a second. Uh, here, this film this year is about food, um, slow food on a fast planet and uh, focused on France. Uh, this Each year the class goes somewhere different. They've been looking at oysters, bees. And when I was uh, there, we were looking at the opening of Cuba and tourism in Cuba and how it could uh, kick back or not. So many uh, uh, facets of the prism of the human journey right now have been explored through film by uh, students. It's great to have some of them here today. So we're gonna show the film in a couple of minutes, but I wanted you to meet uh, some of the team and uh, really pleased to reconnect with uh, Maria Leske, who's an old friend uh, through this, this long journey. Uh, and, the, and what's so interesting too, uh, as these students will tell you and faculty is um, the technology keeps changing. Uh, Maria was just saying when she first started this course, it was VHS, <laughs> uh, you know, mini DVs probably, the uh, little spinning tape. I, I, we'll, I'll ask you about that in a second. And now um, I think I saw a drone shot in this film. We didn't have a drone in 2010. So you can you can all unmute. I just want to, have to sort of do a quick hello from each of you and uh, who you are and uh, how you became who you are so far. And then we'll show the film. Maybe we'll start uh, down with uh, Neith Williams there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, just tell us where you're from, maybe where you are right now, if, you're, if you've already gone back home from space and uh, where you're heading in your career. I'm, I'm here in New York City. I live in Astoria, Queens, um, and I'm, I'm from a little bit of everywhere. I was in the military, so I was born in Illinois, grew up in Texas, and was stationed all over the place. So Astoria is home now, um, and uh, yeah, I'm in the graduate program, and I am looking at opportunities in continuing to create, um, you know, nonfiction uh, documentary style work in, in the media space through, you know, uh, on social media or through other platforms to continue to tell stories like this and, and others. Uh, I like right. the ones about food a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to like the ones about food. And Christina F Figueroa, uh, what's your, uh, where are you from and where do you think you're headed in this fast changing media world? Uh, yes. So yeah, my name is Christina. Um, at the moment I am here on our Pace Pleasantville campus. I will be here all summer. Um, as I am a summer RA, um, but I am from South Jersey, so specifically Mount Laurel, New Jersey. It's about 30 minutes from Philadelphia. Um, where where do I want to go? I, I feel like there's so many different spaces that I, I'd love to to venture out into, specifically, um, you know, film and television, of course. And I love music as well. So if there's an opportunity for me to do some music videos as well, I really like to be creative. I love the camera. I love to edit. So anywhere where I can utilize those skills is somewhere that I'm headed. Great. And Dara Potts, we've been in touch a lot. Uh, you've been helpful in the logistics of setting up this show today. So what's your uh, your quick story? Hi, I'm Dara. I um live in New York City. I'm currently calling in from Wisconsin. I'm here for a family graduation. Um, yeah, I think I I really enjoy storytelling. I'm really passionate about, you know, trying to help get stories told. And that's hopefully what I get to continue to do as my career progresses. And specifically, I am really curious about podcasting as a medium. So hopefully I get to keep doing that. That's awesome. And I'll show the, there's a, there was a blog that went with this film too. And 
I'll show that in a minute too. Jerry McKinstry, you you have a dual role. Uh, you're a student and and at Pace, uh, and, yes. and working at Pace. I, I do work at Pace. I'm the assistant vice president of public affairs here. Um, I am also a student of the graduate program. I'll, I'll be graduating on Monday. I'm very excited about that. But I, I spent much of my career as a print journalist, and when I got to Pace. I met Professor Lesquet and I was doing some public relations uh, for the program and I saw how great it was. And I just thought I, I really wanted to learn um, documentary filmmaking. Uh, it seemed like a natural complement to my previous career. And in communications, uh, visual storytelling is so incredibly important. So, you know, it just seemed to be the perfect fit for me. And I'm really happy I, I joined the program. Great. I'm sure you learned a lot that, again, being on the road dealing with uh, all the logistics and bumps and opportunities is really, uh, there's no way you can do that back home. That's right. You know, I can say you could take this course 10 times and you'll learn something new every time. It's true. So, and Elizabeth Bardon? Bardon? Yes, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I'm from France, um, but I'm ah. currently um, on the Pleasantville campus. Um, and I would love to keep working on documentaries. That's been my dream since I was little. Um, I love this format. Um, so yes, I would love to work on documentaries. What was it like going back to France to shoot a film? It was um, very interesting seeing um, non-French people experience of being in my country, um, but I, I loved it. I loved showing um, all of my teammates, my, my culture, um, our way of eating. Um, it was wonderful. I loved it. Fabulous. And Kathy Capobianco. Hi. I'm Kathy and I'm also on the Pleasantville campus. Um, my biggest hopes for me are to um, continue filmmaking, continue writing. Do I want to do like fictional projects, nonfiction too? I think this whole experience kind of opened me up to that a little bit more and more and that this could also be a medium that I could work in and yeah. Yeah. Whatever I can use my skills in. I'll tell you, there's so much food content on uh, Instagram, TikTok, yeah. uh, Facebook, etc. YouTube. It's some of the, some of the most compelling content I've seen is just someone taking a camera and showing like a, a there was a baker in some unusual place, and they get tens of millions of views. Some of these, mm -hmm. from, from, so the food the food realm is really something. Now, now Maria Leske, my my good friend. Uh, First of all, it's just great to see you again. Someday it'll not be through a piece of glass. I know. So uh, could you just give a little reprise on this, how this course developed and um, where it has come to? Uh, it started out for me, I've been at Pace for 30 years. It started out about 20 years ago. I was approached by one of the faculty members who was going to study abroad, and they wanted me to uh, film their trip in Costa Rica. And I got my class together. And um, we did it. And ever since then, we were, every year it has gotten broader and broader and uh, more and more interesting and better and better. And the technology has changed every year. And uh, storytelling hasn't though. Storytelling is still storytelling. So I think the important piece of this to learn and to remember is that it's all about the story. And I always try to find a really good story. And I think we have we I think that we accomplished it this year, and I think that we have also done that in the past. So that's what I'm happy about. And I also love the fact that students um, use this on their resume to get jobs in the industry. Right. And it is Absolutely. a foot in the door for them. And um, I hear back from so many alumni that tell me that they go on an interview and the first question they ask is, tell me about this documentary. So, so interesting. That's a big deal. I think it's great. Yeah. I think well, it's again, great. It, they're showing they're they're doing the work and showing the work, and you can show how it's you know been utilized and seen. It's just great. So let's actually let's go to the videotape. As uh, what was his name? Werner Wolf used to say on TV. Yeah. Um, hold on one second, and I'll pull up that screen again, and we'll come back uh, shortly after. If folks have questions, post them in the. Uh, chat and we'll get to them. Um, hold on one second. Just having a little trouble finding the screen. Stop screen. There's no producer here except for me. 
share audio. Okay. So we're going to wa start watching and um, you'll all disappear a little bit from the screen, but you'll still be in the green room. Enjoy the, um, the pretzels. There's no beer. There might be some red wine if you look in the back of the little fridge in the green room. Of course, I'm just kidding. So let's watch this wonderful film. And uh, here we go. Culture, heritage, family, love, food, and indeed the land where it is grown is at the heart of our lives. The farms is our heritage, the food is our heritage. In France, the traditions are passed down from generation to generation. They had uh, this, uh, this love for food and good drinking and good food. And so uh, that's where the, the love of good food began in, in France. Effectivement, on peut considérer qu'en France, la nourriture, tout ce dont ce qui nous nourrit, euh, c'est aussi notre héritage, hein, parce qu'en termes historiques, on a tous un grand-parent qui a travaillé, par exemple, dans une ferme ou pour la transformation d'un produit, euh, ou dans les marchés aussi, par exemple. Donc, c'est aussi ça qui nous ancre dans notre territoire. C'est-à-dire que ça fait partie de notre passé et on l'a complètement intégré aujourd'hui dans nos vies, même encore aujourd'hui, et on en est fiers. Inspired by France heritage and history, the international slow food movement began in Paris in 1989 and has spread to over 160 countries. The movement sees a world in which all people can return to the past by embracing and protecting local food cultures and traditions. As a result, people can access and enjoy food that is nourishing, bountiful, and affordable. This concept is defined by three principles, good, clean, fair. This philosophy believes that humans need to abandon the fast life and return to slow and simple living, starting with food.
Alors ici, en tirage, on est sur un territoire rural. Donc on a énormément euh, de paysages verts. On aime aller chercher chez le producteur directement euh, les produits, par exemple. Parce qu'on euh, est un petit producteur, en, alors nous on est en fermier des crues, c'est-à-dire qu'on prend notre lait, on le transforme et on le revend. Il n'y a pas d'intermédiaire entre, il n'y a pas d'affineur et tout, nous on fait tout, il est affiné chez nous. Donc le lait cru, c'est je traite, je travaille mon lait. Le pasteurisé, c'est un mélange de lait. Ou même des fois, il y avait des producteurs qui font leur... Ils le montrent, ils le chauffent pour tuer les bactéries. Que nous, c'est les bactéries naturelles qui travaillent. Nous, en France, on dit que c'est les... les meilleures bactéries puisque c'est ce que les... tout le monde mange et euh, ça vous permet de, de développer de... votre corps et tout, d'avoir une plus d'auto-immune et de protection. Mais c'est vrai qu'après, dans chaque pays, on n'a pas tout à fait les mêmes terrains, les mêmes terroirs. Et tout. Donc, même en France, en France, on n'a pas les mêmes terroirs, ce qui fait aussi qu'on n'a pas les mêmes points. Je on est en fin d'hiver, on va aborder le printemps. Donc on a différentes sortes de salades, dont entre autres la feuille de chêne. Et une, autre, une autre sorte de salade, mais rouge. On va les mélanger, mix, et on mélange l'ensemble pour faire en fait une salade de printemps mélangée. Voilà. Enfin, on, on développe notre production. Les clients nous font confiance. Donc nous. Ça nous pousse à améliorer nos pratiques. Et euh, donc, on va développer le bien-être animal. On va développer, euh, on va utiliser de meilleurs produits pour les élever. Donc, les animaux seront mieux, on aura une meilleure production, les clients seront contents et c'est un cercle comme ça qui nous pousse vers le haut. We want to share what we know. We want to share this passion. We want to share this love. We want to share uh, everything that we do with everyone. For me, France, it is the culture of the wine. And the champagne, of course, it is the part of, the, of this culture. Yes. And you know, the champagne is perhaps a big area in France, but it is little area in the world. Imagine everybody put the glasses and uh, for the toast, is always charm time. Et euh, il y a aussi quelque chose qui est très français, euh, c'est d'aller dans les marchés. Je lève euh, mes volailles, je les achète à 5 semaines, tout petit. Je les élève jusqu'à six mois et après ils sont tués à l'abattoir. On les attrape, ils sont nourris avec du blé, maïs entier et on les attrape et les met à l'abattoir. Ils sont chez nous. Pas des semaines de 70 heures, donc euh, c'est du 7 jours sur 7 pratiquement. Donc si on fait pas ça dans le on peut voter. Donc euh, oui, on met des, des, nos, nos, nos produits locaux en avant pour, euh, pour euh, bah, ex exactement comme vous me dites, pour euh, une expérience, euh, une expérience, donner une expérience à nos, à nos clients, pour leur montrer que même si on est dans, dans le nord de la France, on arrive à avoir des légumes de qualité, des produits de qualité. Et, euh, et par rapport à, à, nos, à nos fournisseurs, à nos nos agriculteurs, 
leur montrer qu'on prête de l'importance à leur travail. En tant que restaurateur, on y arrive. Pourquoi vous, en tant que personne lambda, vous n'y arrivez pas Voilà, on suit, on suit une trame. On, on veut peut-être être, euh, mettre en avant un, un mouvement. Mettre en, en avant le mouvement qu'on arrive à se nourrir en étant sur des produits locaux. Tous les jours, on sait qu'on va avoir un défi et c'est à nous à le relever. Il y a toujours ce grain de sel, ce, cette envie et cette passion qu'il faut alimenter. Voilà, c'est ça, qui, c'est ça qui, qui nous motive. Ce qu'on essaye de faire avec des produits vrais, on n'essaye pas de, de trop les transformer, de trop les changer. Une viande de, de bœuf, si elle a son goût de base, que le, l'agriculteur le travaille bien, c'est pour ça qu'on travaille aussi les produits locaux, s'il la travaille bien, il n'y a pas besoin de, de trop faire pour la sublimer. Il y a juste besoin d'une pince sexuelle, un peu de poivre, c'est bon. Voilà. C'est pour ça aussi que les produits locaux, on les met en avant, parce qu'il y a aussi des gens dans notre, autour de nous qui travaillent dur, et nous, on est juste là pour apporter. On fait une simple cuisson, et on sublime son, son travail, mais on ne va pas jusqu'à euh, la modifier. Bonjour, ici vous êtes au Jardin d'Hélène. Le Jardin d'Hélène, c'est une entreprise euh, où j'accueille les, les personnes, soit sous forme de repas, pour leur euh, faire déguster des plantes sauvages, soit sous forme de stage, pour apprendre à cuisiner les plantes sauvages. C'est aussi un retour aux sources, aux vraies valeurs, au bien manger. Alors déjà, pour moi, c'est important de cuisiner des produits d'origine biologique. Donc déjà, pour tout ce qui est fruits, enfin, surtout légumes, je travaille avec un maraîcher local à à peu près 15 km d'ici. Pour le fromage, c'est pareil, 4 km, c'est ce que je vous disais tout à l'heure. Et puis après, viennent forcément les plantes sauvages. Donc, je cueille dans des endroits protégés. Déjà, j'ai le jardin. Alors, je pense que ma passion a toujours été là pour les plantes sauvages. Une plante que vous allez cueillir, fraîchement cueillie, dans un endroit où la plante a choisi de pousser. Donc, non seulement elle va être riche en minéraux, mais elle va être riche aussi en énergie, parce qu'elle a, elle a ça, c'est ça aussi que ça nous apporte finalement. Il a fallu que les plantes sauvages arrivent dans la Et quand vous commencez à vous intéresser à ça, c'est un monde exceptionnel. C'est vraiment important et motivant de toujours amener de la nouveauté que les clients nous nous rendent en nous félicitant chaque semaine. C'est vraiment une motivation en soi de de pouvoir avoir la chance de changer de carte et d'avoir la liberté de produit. Ensuite, pour les idées, c'est assez aléatoire en fonction des saisons. Là, on est plus sur la fin de l'hiver, donc on va commencer tout doucement à arrêter les petits marrons, les, les courges, toutes ces choses-là, pour rebasculer sur quelque chose de plus printanier. Comme je vous ai montré, on a le produit, on garde l'étiquette, les, les, les légumes sont livrés tous les deux jours, lavés directement, traités ensuite. Et ben, la viande essentiellement de France. Après, il y a certains produits que eux sélectionnent européens. Parce que notre fournisseur de viande, admettons, il ne va pas aller chercher plusieurs fournisseurs pour un produit. À titre exemple, le canard, il a un fournisseur spécifiquement dans la France, un des meilleurs. Il s'est avéré que cette année, il avait un peu de grippe aviaire. Ils n'ont pas été rechercher un autre fournisseur. Ils ont dit on n'aura pas de canard cette année. Donc nous, derrière, il faut qu'on s'adapte. Si j'avais l'envie de faire du canard, bah, ça ne sera pas possible. Après nous, on est quand même une, pour ce type de restaurant, on est quand même une équipe assez jeune, soudée, pleine de créativité. Où 
Welcome to Paris. Uh, my name is Roland Samancar. Uh, I'm 100% French, actually, and Parisian. And I have my restaurant uh, right in the middle of uh, Montmartre and Pigalle. What we look, it's freshness of ingredients. That's the most important. It's also the flavors, because your ingredients may be fresh, but they have to be tasty. And you really have to feel something. And that's why it was really important today to be in this market. You meet people who planted or like created the cheese. Bonjour, vous allez bien? The most important is to share the passion and to listen to the producer when they explain. Magnifique. S'il vous plaît. Il est chez alors, ce roquefort? Parfait. Now we are like really looking for the vegetables, the fresh one, but also the bio, biological one. So no GMOs. Mm. Okay. Excellent. What's good about Kevin and his shop is that uh, he's going straight to see the producer and he plants with the producer, for example, this type of uh, strawberries called Magnum and the other one is and Grim. Is the, he's been doing it, he's been planting it. And that's amazing, like farm to market. Come with your family. It's going to be on a Saturday morning. It's going to be on Sunday morning. It's time to reunite. It's the time to be to share something that's the farm to market products. What's the most important in French quality bread and in French food, French gastronomy, I would say, and what makes it so good in the world is that we take time to do things. And time is key to good things. Pour le pain, bah déjà, c'est l'amour de Dieu joué. Déjà d'une part, quelque part. Euh, du coup, où est-ce que est venue ma passion Tout simplement, c'est parce que mon père était boulanger aussi. Donc c'est la passion qui s'est transmise. Et euh, sur le fait que quand j'étais petit, bah, j'allais justement dans sa boulangerie. C'est quoi, ça a été dur. Il y a, il y a, des, il y a eu des périodes dures. Et c'est ces périodes dures qui nous apprend à devenir encore meilleur sur notre métier. Tout simplement. Et c'est aussi l'amour de ce métier qui fait qu'il peut perdurer dans ce métier-là aussi. C'est sûr. This restaurant that we're in here is called Milagro. The idea here is to offer elevated bistro food. My culinary training has always been focused around the really wonderful, beautiful ingredients that we get here in France. I don't work with a lot of various spices in my cuisine. I focus on the beauty and simplicity of you know, showcasing the ingredient itself simply because the quality of what we get is so incredible. There's certain flavor profiles or kind of maybe punches of flavor that I find to be maybe a little more bold that would come from the U.S. But the quality of the ingredients here, the flavors of the ingredients here are like none that I have had in the U.S. So my thought process is to kind of bring some of these more bolder flavors using these great ingredients and getting the best of both worlds. What's really important for us in France is always to re reunite around a table. And what's better in life than food? What's the difference between the United States and Europe? Culture and sustainability. It's about knowing where your food comes from. It's about knowing what's in your food. It's slow food and it's farm to table. I think in Europe in general, 
especially France and Italy, uh, this is part of their culture. In the areas, uh, especially that aren't urban, they grow their own food, they make their own wine, they raise their own chickens, everything is done right in the village. And, uh, and that's been going on forever. I have visited uh, America a lot of years, and uh, the first difference for me is, wow, everything is big. <laughs> uh, like a coffee is big, uh, a car is big, uh, the farm are big. And so uh, here, it's, everything is smaller. <laughs> very impressive thing that I discovered in the, in the grocery store was how all of the vegetables were very perfect. They, are, they were very bright in color and they were kind of shiny. But in France, when you go to local market, um, you don't have like the, the in-between, you know, grocery store and things. It's, it's literally from the farm to your plate and uh, it's not perfect. It's probably still with a little bit of um, uh, mud on it. <laughs> so the truth is, Everything is farm to table, right? All the food in the world is grown on a farm, hopefully a healthy farm, but there are commodity farms and they do generate a lot of food, but it's not necessarily what we wanted to sell here and, and offer here to our guests. We wanted a cleaner, no hormones, no steroids, no antibiotics. Uh, we really want chemical free food. And uh, in order to do that, to guarantee it, you have to know the farms and the farmers who are growing the food. I started Fable in 2015 with my wife, Kristen. We were very concerned about the food that we were eating, the pesticides and the toxic chemicals that were being used in agriculture. So we started the farm growing heirloom tomatoes, raising free range chickens, and really just trying to grow the produce that we wanted to have in our bodies. To me, farm to table is about growing or having access to produce that you want to eat yourself or sharing it with the community. We are growing the produce here that we want my family to eat and to share to all of my family and friends and also to the local restaurants that we sell to and to the chefs. It's less expensive to just get on the phone and call the local purveyor and he shows up the next day with a truck and they unload whatever it is that they have. Back during World War I and World War II, the government, rightfully so, was subsidizing farms to help farmers grow during the war. That kept prices down. Prices didn't catch up. So in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of most farmers, produce is actually not that expensive. Everyone should be paying more for their produce. And in this way, you would be paving the farmers more. We can pay our staff better and then they can go support your businesses. So it's like, a, it's like an upward circle in that manner. So the farm to table doesn't have to take in consideration the distance. It's really the consideration of quality. It's very, very, very high quality, but it can be comes also with very, very, very high prices. So to me, the, the farm to table, the nitty, who don't care about the price. The slow food is more the producer to the consumer with a concern of being affordable. In order to eat simpler, healthier food and support the farms, um, sourcing directly from them, going and shopping at the actual farm, going to farmers markets, being willing to pay more for your produce to support those farms. That's how you're gonna be able to eat healthier and source simpler food. And that's how to support the farms that want to grow more as well. For me, it was really a message that I wanted to make pass because I think it's an urgent planetary to take care of yourself, to take care of others, and to respect the earth. There's really an urgency.
we're only here for a short period of time and it's our responsibility to make the earth, this plot of land, a farm, a vineyard, whatever it might be, better for the next person who takes it over. We're only here for a little while and we have to take care of what we have. This is behind the scenes yes, now. Behind the scenes. Great. Just a little behind the scenes. <laughs> the credit outtakes are always the most fun. I worked here in a past life. You're kind of giving you're kind of giving a Oh, we? Is that what you mean? Take it off. Take it off. I mean, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Geese can be very uh, interesting. Oh, yes. It chased me. <laughs> well, bravo. Thank Congra you. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> so hold on. Oh, wait. Oh, oh, there was one more little riff there at the end. I think I might have missed. Um, maybe it was coming attractions. Um, so maybe we'll just start in. Uh, I heard about a goose attack. Um, could you just explain what, what were some of the logistical challenges here? Maybe we'll start with the, the livestock. Uh, who would like to jump in on that? Go ahead, Elizabeth. You had the goose go after you. Oh, well, when we were on that farm, I the past credit something funny that i could do was interview um the animals and so i interviewed a cow i mean interview you know i pretended to interview a cow and so mm -hmm. i wanted to interview the goose and it started chasing me um and everyone was being very serious listening to the farmer and i was by myself in the little corner and i came back to the team screaming i was like oh my god did you see that and they all looked at me like i was crazy <laughs> um yeah. but um Yes, that, that was, no, that the, was the story. Uh, any other logistical challenges? Anything they usually yeah. are? I, I would say probably the most obvious logistical challenge um, was that most of us <laughs> didn't speak French. Elizabeth ah. was really our only um, right. <laughs> French speaker, which, uh, and she did a fantastic job. I mean, this really, we owe so much to her for doing that. Um, it, it posed a problem for the rest of us because we couldn't necessarily react um, immediately to answers, you know, or, you know, sometimes right. you have, you want to volley back and forth. So we had to really rely on Elizabeth to do that. You're reminding me of um, way, way back in 1989, when I was in the Amazon rainforest, uh, researching my book on the murder of Chico Mendes, a Brazilian activist. 
I had taken a crash course in Portuguese before I went. And I had a young man with me who was uh, a Brazilian graduate student who was working in New York. And he came as sort of my uh, translator. But there were after he left, there were interviews I was doing where absolutely I was just recording them, knowing that later I would translate them, catching a little bit of the just asking follow-up questions in terrible Portuguese. But but having that same kind of sense of not fully getting things while I was in the middle of them, which I think uh, can be really challenging. But you certainly captured things very well. And, and you did uh, maybe talk about how this got framed and organized. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we just go around and see who had what roles uh, in, 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 in the film. Uh, Kathy and, and then uh, Elizabeth, we heard a little bit about you uh, interviewing the, the, wild, the livestock. But did Kathy, just tell us a little bit about what you did. So I think myself and kind of all of us kind of did a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. like on set, camera operator, cinematographer, lighting did that. Um, and then, oh, pre-production, we all did the research and everything. And post-production, editor, worked on color correction and all of that, yeah. So a little, little bit of everything, whatever you can help in. And um, uh, Jerry, what was your, um, how, how did this work for you? Scramble, yeah. scramble. Yeah, again, it was, um, we kind of dove in and, and did a little bit of everything. Um, I, I fil filmed, edited, researched. Again, I think that was something we all did. And we broke up into different crews and mm -hmm. we would rotate. So then, you know, one day or I, not even one day, you, you know, one hour, one, two hours, you, you might be on camera, you might be on sound might be on background. Um, so we just rotated several times. These crews were rotated very often. So we all got hands on. I mean, this is as experiential learning as it gets, you know, just right. really 14 weeks start to finish. Professor Lesquet and Professor Liu do a phenomenal job of organizing us and, and really keeping us on task as well. So um, I'll, let, I'll let everybody else say how, yeah. how challenging it is to get it done in, in that amount of time. And how did you choose the location, the actual, the places you went in France? Um, who is, uh, who can speak to that? Well, I was going to ask Neith to take that. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yep. Um, so uh, Dr. Loske can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, initially there was uh, a plan for uh, this to be a location, specifically Lon, the region we went to, for uh, apiaries uh, and bees. Um, unfortunately, due to circumstances of the, the COVID pandemic, they weren't able to travel that year. So she had to shift gears, and she's uh, super flexible. She, she could have been a Marine. We used to say, Semper Gumby, <laughs> when I was at the Marines, always flexible, make the best of what you have. So exactly. she took the opportunity and, and got us over there, uh, focusing more on, on cuisine. Um, the region we went to, or the actual department within the region, the uh, Poste de France, um, Elizabeth can jump in and correct my uh, my and then pronunciation of everything. But the Holstein France, <laughs> the entire region, um, in in 2021 was awarded at the uh, Gastronomy Award um, from it's a, it's a longer term. It's the IGCAT. It's for gastronomy, cuisine, arts, and tourism, and they were awarded that as the Gastronomy Region of Europe for 2023. Um, so. Specifically, the entire region, but the department we were in was in Osni, and that uh, at, the, at the southern end um, gets close to the Champagne region. It's got a lot of agriculture, um, and they're continuing to grow uh, a website for the 2023 year that shows all the different organizations in that entire Pulse de France region of uh, chefs and cuisines and different farmers and uh, bakers, pretty much anybody that's working in food. They've uh, taken that award and are growing um, interest in their their products and their region's <laughs> um, food and sustainability specifically because of the law the the you know the uh, the different rules and guidelines that they've passed in France to try to grow sustainably, uh, bring in their food from uh, very you know as local as possible. Uh, we spoke to one chef and he said the the only thing that he didn't have was local. He admitted were um, his his citrus because he was like well yeah. I, don't, 
I don't have an orange. I don't have an orange tree. <laughs> sure. But uh, I mean, even here, I mean, they're they're coming from. He said they came from Spain, which uh, geographically is much closer than when we get stuff here in New York from much much farther destinations. So uh, it was a really interesting area. And uh, one thing of I, uh, Professor Lasque has been when I was working on the course. Uh, you try to minimize uh, voiceover. There, there's really good voiceover from uh, a colleague. Uh, the, uh, I'm blanking on her name right now. The woman who uh, arranged a lot of the travel. For Francoise. Our... Francoise, right. Francoise has been with us for, Andy, since your last year, you said was 2016. 2016. Oh, the first year was 2011, yeah. Okay, so Francoise has been with us um, <laughs> be prior to that. So she's been our travel guide on these trips since probably 2009 or 10. Um, and she's from France. So right. when I started to talk to her about this and Neith mentioned, you know, this was the um, destination for the, for the B documentary in 2020 that had to get canceled because of COVID. So right. Um, we found the bees that were, were relocated from the, uh, the top of Notre Dame, and they happened to be relocated to this region. And that's how we first heard about this region. So Francoise was really beneficial in helping us put it all together. And then when I was looking for the voiceover, the first person that came to mind was Francoise, and she was actually moving to France the day after she recorded the voiceover with us. She was leaving New York. <laughs> And she was moving to France. And Dara was one of the students who went to her apartment and um, shot her interview in Manhattan. Boxed up, empty apartment, and shot her interview before she left. So That's it was my cool. ode to Francoise. On uh, this. I like that. And um, so I imagine you ate some food. <laughs> How did that all go? Who? Any? It's any phenomenal. <laughs> Any idea, what were some of the best experiences or, or were there any uh, unusual things you hadn't eaten before that you experienced? Oh yeah, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like Andrew's alluding to something. <laughs> Maybe he, heard, he, was, he must heard the story about the myocaster. Oh boy. Myocaster a... being... I'm not, I'm not going to tell it. I think let's let Elizabeth tell that story since she <laughs> can probably do the translation for us even better. How about, how about you try that, Elizabeth? So on our first day, um, we were tasting different um, different dishes from that region. Um, and there was this, oh, how do you call it in English? It's like a meat pâté. Yeah. A pa I mean, in French, it's called a pâté, but it's like a, a, yeah. a meat that you spread on, 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 on bread and we're all eating it. I think it tastes wonderful. And then I asked the people uh, in French, what is it? And I didn't know the exact translation of a Myrocaster. So I told Dr. Leske that we were eating beavers. <laughs> and Dr. Leske was like, <laughs> we're eating beavers? Which in the end, eating Myrocaster, I guess, is not better than eating a beaver. But beaver. that wasn't, that, that is unusual. Even for me from France, that was unusual. Um, we also ate some uh, very strong cheese. Um, called oh, Mahual that has a very, very strong smell and taste um, that Dr. Leske really did not like. Mm -hmm. We um, we see it in the documentary. Um, <clears throat> it was like in a cave um, and we were in a very small cave and we were all in there, uh, 17 of us. And the smell was, I feel like we were infused with the smell after. <laughs> I, I could mm. smell it on my skin, on the cameras everywhere. Um, yes, we also... Cool. I uh, went to um, a champagne vineyard where we tasted six different champagnes, I believe. Um, that was wonderful. Oh, what a chore. Yes. It's hard work. And we took a cooking class and we actually yes. participated in a cooking class, all of us. And that was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Oh, there's the cave. Yes. There's that that yeah. stinky cheese. There's the stinky cheese. <laughs> they actually make a phenomenal tart with it that they, it's almost like it kind of resembles a pizza and they, they melt that cheese on top of it. It's, it's pretty. Oh, fresh. that does sound good. I, and I actually am partial. I, I'd have to see if it's over the top, but I do like some of those smelly cheeses. You'd love to go there someday. Um, 
Were there any frustrations? I know uh, Professor Lasquez and I used to encourage everyone to get every possible angle to think about B-roll all the time. Did you get one of the issues sometimes can be when you get back and you go, oh, damn, why didn't I heck, fill in the blank? Was there anything that you didn't do that you, you regret now? That's a very, that's a very a loaded question, Andy, because first <laughs> of all, the expression is not, oh, damn. No, I know. <laughs> I was being gentle. And yeah, um, and there were, um, I know that there were many times that we wish we got more footage of certain things. Um, yes. I, I, and you know, this, it's, it's not something that, it's something that always happens. It doesn't, um, right. doesn't fail. Every semester we either can't find something uh, we wish we had <laughs> shot or we look for more of it. And uh, yeah. And, or, you know, something is out of frame or something, you know, we, yeah. the audio is not right. I mean, it, it, oh, it's inevitable. It's just inevitable. And, and I, I said this the night of the premiere, it's a class. It's still a class and they are learning. Right. So, you know, every year we have to really decide, um, you know, how we have to now it's lessons learned, you know, what do we know that happened this year that we have to, we, and every year since you and I have done this, Lou Guarneri and I do this, I, I've wrangled Lou into this class with me. And every year we discuss at the end of the semester, we've been talking about it, Lou and I all week, how we make changes for next year, the things that we know that we have to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and we go through that. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a learning process and it's always a class. So there's always something that we regret not filming. Yeah. This if I add, add that um, one point to this, what in my observation in going through the footage afterwards, it, it progressively seemed to get better. You know, day one, the footage was what it was. <laughs> Day right. two is getting better. Day three, like you could see, you know, Professor Leske talks about being a class. In going through footage, it seemed to really get people were getting better shots as as the days were going. We also learned how to work together as a team as time went on, right? We all were able to be in that position and know our roles and know our strengths. And as that week got on, we got stronger as a team, which was really great to experience as well. Hey, right. just to add on to that, like. Um, as well as our, a big part of our teamwork, I think, as well was, yeah, it, even if we didn't have a spot for a, a certain part of where somebody was speaking, we would work together to try and find something to put there. Or we would literally go and, and shoot, whether it's around here in Pleasantville or somebody was in New York City or if we needed to go in the back of supermarkets and get trucks and things like that. Like we always work together to find a way to um, overcome any struggles that we had. Mm hmm. And one of the, you know, whether it's a uh, an Oscar nominated documentary or a student documentary, <clears throat> I've done a number of shows here now with filmmakers where um, the the film is part of a um, bigger project or the, the campaign film. There are all these different ways of creating films now, where the film is just like one component of of what's uh, driving things. And obviously, social media is important. You had a very dynamic um, Instagram feed here which i'm showing andy uh, do you remember my line about social uh, media? i sure do and you, can you repeat that social media only works if you're social there you go i, I think that's it yeah that's it well Did, it's, is that's that something i was just reading about uh, there was a new york times article recently about students who are going back to flip phones who are like abandoning the whole social media realm I've done uh, written and done a bunch of webcasts on Twitter on um, how to use these media and not be abused by them. You know what I mean? Um, and how, so how, how do you all handle that part of this? Uh, this is not a controversial topic uh, mostly. So maybe it's a little simpler than, than in some other re arenas, but are you, the, who was had, like, was there someone who was the, the main, I didn't look at the credits to see who was sort of the main person for social media, but did you have a wrangler for all that stuff and a sort of a logistical strategy? Elizabeth well, as you, <laughs> as you saw the way um, that Dara was um, following up with you and I, Dara right. was the social, she is very, very detailed. So she was our social media manager, but um, everyone contributed. Elizabeth um, was you know, instrumental in putting a lot of this stuff on Instagram. So I think 
everybody had a part in it. There was a lot going on. And Andy, you remember this, you know, the social media part, you really have to designate pieces to everyone. And mm -hmm. the blog, because of you, still exists. So we, <laughs> you started us on the blogging for a better planet, and we use the blog uh, in the class. And we had an editor of the blog who is a digital journalism major, um, and she actually posted all of the blogs every week, uh, sometimes two a week, from the very beginning, from the you know from week one to week fourteen. So we have a blog for every week. And uh, that was also, so everything, as you know, everything we can do to make it social, right? Right. To include social media is what we do. So there it is. Yeah, so many, and these, these skills will come in handy going forward because again, every media, every film medium has a campaign around it, whether it's on TikTok or um, the, the recent one on uh I I can't think of one that was in sort of Oscar consideration this past year or documentaries that didn't wasn't part of a bigger project. So and, and could you just run down the how the curriculum has evolved at the Pace Media program? Because you mentioned digital media as a course now. You know, I, I did introduce the blogging course way back when. But what else is there now that uh, wasn't there five or ten years ago? So um, the undergraduate. We have four different majors. Students can major in digital cinema and filmmaking. That's new. Students can major in digital journalism. They can major in public relations and they can major in communications. So the Department of Media Communications and Visual Arts has four undergraduate majors. And then, as you remember, uh, I launched the graduate program at Pace. That is now completely online and that degree is communications and digital media. And in this class, Neith, and Jerry and Dara are graduate students and Christina, Kathy and Elizabeth are undergraduate students. So what I did was I combined this class. So it used to be where I combined two classes, the undergraduate and graduate. And now I offer the graduate class. So the undergraduates like Kathy and uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, Dara, I mean, Kathy and uh, Christina and Elizabeth took this as a graduate class. So yeah, there it is. It's right. online. Thank you. MA in communications yeah. and digital media. And I'm the director of that program. I do remember um, there was a, sometimes, actually, this was not just in the film course, but the undergrads sometimes kick butt. <laughs> well, they kicked butt in this class as well, because they, um, under the direction of Lou Guarneri, have mm -hmm. taken a, a lot of his undergraduate classes in cinematography one and two. And as you know, and you commented on, about this, that we have a drones class as well. And wow. Adam Ng, who is our drone pilot, certified, licensed drone pilot, Adam actually flew the drone. And that started last year uh, in Cape Cod when we did the oyster farming in Connecticut and New York. And then he also, he took the class as an undergraduate and then he took the class as a graduate student. And uh, he also, he's the, a drone pilot, pilot, so he flew the drone. So yeah, drones are very popular. And Dr. Wow. Keith Fink and Lou Garneri, uh, Professor Lou Garneri teach those classes. So- Wow, uh, that's, that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I think I'm looking, this must've been a, a drone yeah. shot unless it was from a bridge. Yep, that was us, no, that was us, yep. Amazing. Here in the uh, Oyster, and the Oyster documentary, by the way, has garnered many awards. Jerry can go through the list of them for you, mm -hmm. but many awards, and uh, that gets, has gotten a lot of recognition. And as you know, I now will enter the uh, France uh, for the love of food into as many competitions as possible. And uh, hopefully all of these students on the resume will be able to say award-winning award documentary filmmaker. That's the goal. Wow. So uh, maybe one more round of um, uh, something you take away from this film. What, one thing I really liked about the course, given my focus on sustainability, you know, the environment and stuff, was that the students were, um, it was not, they were not environmental science or environmental journalism students. They're students who are going into careers in all, all aspects of media, 
but then ended up with some little understanding in their head of what sustainability looks like or the opposite. What, you know, when we went to Baja, Mexico and saw fishermen struggling economically, you know, dealing with, uh, oh, these darn sea turtles, <laughs> you know, so many of these films um, uh, have that tension between economic and um, environmental progress. Maybe food in a way, there is enough of a market for slow food for, for this cuisine that it might have a little less of that tension. But I just love maybe one last thought from each of you on what you've took away here. Uh, what can um, inform whatever career you take going forward? Maybe maybe down with uh, Neith and then around the circle and then we'll all get toward dinner unless those, some of you are not, not in the East Coast time zone. I, uh, I learned something very valuable from the French and, and I don't know how we get it done in America, but um, I noticed that they... They don't have a lot of food deserts because every little community had a way of having a weekly um, uh, market that always brought in food. And it wasn't at their farmer's market. It wasn't just some vegetables. It was also, uh, you know, people who were uh, chickens and, and beef and everything. You could literally get everything there. And it was weekly, sometimes more than weekly. I noticed the ones in Paris all overlapped. So there was never a time when there wasn't a market that you could go and get fresh produce that came from very close and um, I mean we have Union Square Market and stuff in New York City and they try to do that but it's it, we have so much accessibility to walk into any store and just get groceries at a whim so it's hard to make that choice and I noticed that a lot of the little towns that we went into um, there's not that there were the markets and they got yeah. their food and produce from these markets and creating something that's sustainable like that in America where people strive to get that food first instead of the easy stuff and then I, I'm sure you're up in Maine Andy, I'm sure you see the food deserts where the only thing up there is a, is a Dollar General. And if you're oh, buying yeah. your week's groceries at the Dollar General, you're probably not getting anything too fresh. And so I've, I've learned a lot about that. I want to explore that more. Uh, I find it fascinating. And I don't, I, I don't know what we do, but um, to see a European model of that is, is pretty impactful. And I feel like if they can do it, we have, we have the means to do it. It's just a choice. So. that's that's great that's that's super yeah we just bought some lobster that are locally produced but we you know as you say we're economically able to do that lobster is not the kind of food that uh poor struggling elderly main residents in rural areas can get even those who uh get the lobster who who capture ca catch it uh struggle um christina any thoughts going forward you know what what did you learn that you're going to take forward in your next steps <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, kind of going off what Need said a little bit, I literally was astonished by, you know, the way that they operate there with food and like literally the love and passion they have for it. And um, hence our title for the love of food. <laughs> um, it's it's truly something that they that they, you know, present as, as such a big part of, of their life. And it was honestly very inspiring for me. And it made me want to come back to the United States and implement those customs into my everyday life, whether that's going to a local market um, or, you know, shopping organically. Um, we were able to, to you know, we went to Fable, which is not too far from the Pace Pleasantville campus. So mm -hmm. new to me, I definitely want to go back and like pick, you know, fresh produce for myself. Um, and another big thing that I really took away from this project was the, the um, you know, the importance of teamwork. This was personally my first time collaborating with so many different types of people and people right. that I've seen around the department, but haven't really gotten the opportunity to speak, you know, closely with or, or work with. Um, <clears throat> so I think this this production really brought us together and gave us the opportunity to be creative with, with one another. Um, and I think it kind of all brought us closer. I feel like this experience, this docs class is something that, you know, is kind of bonding. We're all kind of bonded for life. I will always remember all of these people. So and it was great working with them, of course, with Dr. Leske and Professor Garnier as well. They're great and they led us in a great direction. So, Yeah, that yeah, teamwork for sure. When you're writing a paper in a class, it's not teamwork unless you're working with ChatGPT. <laughs> Dara, any any last takeaway from, from you? Yeah, kind of expanding on what Christina was just saying too. A, a major theme that we noticed while we were there was how food and meal time was more than just eating to get fuel. It was everything. It was family. It was friends. Yeah. It was like oh, it was a huge part of their life. And I think 
bringing that into my own life, like that my meal time can be an opportunity to connect with my loved ones or to show love to people and all of that. And I think that that was a really amazing thing to get to learn more about and how important it is. And also this class, I think, is an amazing opportunity because this is the closest real world experience that we are going to get. And it is amazing to have the opportunity to do this and be, oh, I loved this. I loved this experience. That is a great kind of vote of confidence that, okay, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I can keep moving in this direction and like things are going to work out. And so it's, we are really privileged to have an opportunity to take a class like this at Pace. That's great. And Jerry. You know, um, it was a reminder of um, having an awareness of where your food comes from. And if you, you know, know the local farmer or you go to the farmer's market um, and just make conscious efforts of what you're selecting, um, you're, you know, you're going to make better decisions. You're not going to waste food. You're going, you know, I, I have a family, I have kids and you, you, you just don't like to see too much food wasted. And I think when you're you know, going to the farmer's market, know how, how, how hard it is to grow a tomato, how hard it is to grow an apple, um, what goes into growing chickens or, or you know, raising chickens. Um, you just, you, you'll respect it a whole lot more and make better decisions. Um, one other thing, just as an administrator at Pace, um, I'll, I'll say what I really learned, one of the things I cherish about this program and this class is that I get to work side by side with the students and get to see how fantastic they are. I get to see how great the professors are. And just um, it helps me in my day job of just promoting the university and what wonderful things are going on here. Yeah, it, it brings pace out into the world in, in really interesting ways. Uh, and Kathy? Um, kind of piggybacking off of what everyone said about about being more conscious about what you eat and everything, because I feel like in America, as we know, everything is so fast. It's always like, I got like I'm on the move. I need to grab something on the move and everything. And what I took, what I took about that experience in France was that, like Dara said, it is like your meal time. It should be a time with friends and family and everything, and to have that time to sit, to chat, to like learn about each other's day and everything. It should be like that. And we should incorporate that more into our lives and everything. And I feel like for me, um, taking this class away, I learned, I think I learned more and more that this is exactly what I want to do with my life and my career. I think it just solidified it even more and more. Mm. And another thing that I'm so grateful for was for working with this team and how wonderful of a team we are. I came into this class like with friends and I feel like and I feel like I only strengthened those relationships more and more and I created and I created more relationships that I, I will take for the rest of my life and I'm I'm very very grateful for the entire experience and for everything that I'll take creatively from it fantastic and Elizabeth from France yeah. I mean, for me, it's a little different because it is the way I grew up and I was raised. Mm -hmm. um, I only came to the United States when I was 16. So I grew up in that environment of, you know, eating organic, clean food. Um, but it made me fell back in love with my country. And then now I want to go back and I want to go back and live there because I've realized how great it is. <laughs> um, but as of a career. I've, you know, as I said at the beginning, I, I've always wanted to work on documentaries. So this, as soon as I learned about this class two years ago, I was like, I want to do it. This is, this, this was made for me. I want to, I want to make a documentary. So being able to participate in the class and do it on, on my culture, my country was the greatest experience I've had so far in my school experience, like high school, college. Um, and it, just solidified the idea that I want to work on long form stories like documentaries and um, uh, with a team and being um, a storyteller. So, yes. Fantastic. So, Professor Lasquez, you have the final word here. Um, you, you've created quite a um, phenomenon with this course. I, I think uh, I certainly it's been unforgettable for, for me in the years that I participated in it. Um, that everything that's been said, the teamwork, 
the uh, learning in on, in the field of sort of learn and adjust is something that is a vital skill to have in any career now, um, mm -hmm. certainly in the media, because everything's changing all the time. So having the the bumps and bruises and mistakes and um, figuring out how to make something better out of it on the run and to keep the batteries charged, you know, preparedness, uh, agility, these are all skills that um, everyone needs, including your audience. So what do, what do you, congratulations, I'll just say to you. Thank you. It's real life, Andy. You know, I tell them, you know, what has changed since you and I did this, what this is that the students are interviewed before they can, there's a waiting list for this class now. Wow. So students are interviewed by me and um, I, I really drill into them the fact that this is going to be a lot of work. I'm going to require a lot of work from you. It's real life. This is the way it's going to be in the future. And, um, you know, I want them to understand that they're part of a production team. And I'm glad that a few of them said that, you know, this is, this is what your job in the industry is really going to be like. And one of the things that I think I took away from it truthfully is that, you know, during the pandemic, everybody was stuck at home. And a lot of things that people did was started gardens and they started growing their own food and people have continued to do that. And, you know, my son, Jameson, you remember he's 29 now, he has been eating this way forever and trying to get our family to do this. And he's been right all along. You know, my 29 year old has taught me a lot. And to me, he knew what he was talking about. You know, what is in your food? You need to know. And it's important that you continue to um, be sustainable and look at the way things are grown and, um, you know, eating healthier and making sure that you do go to farmer's markets. Um, the chefs taught us that. The farmers taught us that in France. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, we do it a lot more. So every year that I do this, Andy, I learn something from the students. I learn as much from them and from this topic as they learn from me. And I, I enjoy this experience more and more. So uh, again, you know, it's, it's a big, I think it's a win-win all the way around. I think that um, I hope to continue to do it. I know that uh, the students are interested in finding out where I'm going next year. And I don't know yet, but we'll figure it out. And, you know, it's always one of those things that I'm reading something in the times or I'm reading something online and I say to myself, that's a story. It's never the location. It's always the story. We follow the story. So to me, there's got to be that, that, uh, you know, the, that hook. So if anyone wants to reach out to me at mlusque at pace.edu and tell me an idea that they have for a story, I would be very happy to uh, entertain their idea and listen. So thank you for having us. We really appreciate it you coming back and uh, bringing us into to your side of the world now. I think you are muted. I am muted? No, Andy was muted. I'm, yes. I'm muted. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, there's <laughs> lots of stories up here in Maine. Uh, yes. And blueberries, the, the migrant workers, blueberries, uh, amazing, beautiful, fascinating process. Of course, everything in the ocean here is, you, you've done already quite a few ocean stories, but mm -hmm. thanks again to all you for spending the time, especially at the end of a hard week. Uh, congratulations on the premiere. And uh, uh, this, as soon as we're done, this this film, that this video we've just done can be shared on all these different uh, platforms. Feel free to download it, chop it up and put it on Instagram or TikTok. And and good luck uh, through the summer. Good luck with your careers going forward. And um, get in touch anytime. Uh, and I can do more of these webcasts with, with each of you, any of you, as you have come across stories that are too good not to share. This is Andy Revkin, Columbia Climate School up in Maine. Uh, and hope that everyone who's watching will share this with someone later on. And uh, get in touch always with your stories. Take care, uh, have a good weekend, and congratulations again to the uh, Paystocks team for uh, another spectacular film and a long series. Thank you. Hold on one second. <laughs>